a time to be born and there is a time to die. Good evening, everyone. Good afternoon. And welcome to the celebration of the funeral service of our dear brother, Bruno Moraine, affectionately known as Mr. Lloyd Moraine. And I'm sure most persons here could identify with the name Lloyd. On behalf of the parish priests and parishioners, I wish to extend our heartfelt condolences to the family, his wife, his children, and all other related family members. We are going to begin our celebration of life this evening with our tributes, and so I kindly ask persons who are going to be doing tributes this afternoon to stand by. Let us also be mindful that we are in God's house, we are in a sacred place, and so we kindly ask that we turn off all cell phones for the short time that we are here. There is so much we can say about Brother Lloyd, and I'm sure each one of us this afternoon is here because we would have had some form of encounter with him, whether it's through his children or personally through him. For me, Mr. Lloyd was my neighbor, and more so, we also, when he was actively involved, we also attended the same church at Pomrose. So it is a very sad time for the family, and we really want to be with them as they go through this difficult period. So to begin our tributes, I'm going to invite Mr. Ken Rennie, a special cousin of the family, to pay tribute. So it doesn't seem as if he's here. So we are going to move on to the second person on the list, which is Alana Mitchell, a granddaughter. This would follow, be followed by a special tribute from Fishery. So the person responsible, please prepare yourself. We'd also like to recognize the presence of former parliamentarian, Honorable Brother Oliver Joseph and Brother Jocelyn Whiteman. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alana Mitchell. Um, oh, can everyone hear me now? Is this better? All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Alana Mitchell, and um, my tribute is entitled, A Letter to Our Grandfather. Dear Grandpa, as the waves of time carry us forward, we find ourselves anchored in the memories of your extraordinary life, a life filled with laughter, love and adventure. We are proud to call you our grandfather, boasting to anyone who would listen that you owned a boat on the Carnage and were a skilled fisherman. How many can truly say that their grandfather owned a boat? Not many, I can assure you that. Let's not forget whenever we visit you, we will always get a sweet treat or a soda. It's like a special bonus on top of already having the best grandpa ever. It was a badge of honor for us, a testament to your hard work, dedication, hard work and dedication, sorry, to provide for your family. At home, you had your favorite chair, where you'd kick back and dangle your feet out of the window, completely at ease, while indulging in your favorite pastime watching African movies. Those moments were filled with your sudden burst of disbelief or laughter at the plot twists, and your jokes that never failed to make us all laugh. 
This will always be a cool memory for all of us. Grandpa, you were a chef. You could really put a pot together. With a deft hand and generous heart, you transformed simple ingredients into culinary masterpieces. Whether it was your signature fish, fish broth, pumpkin soup, or a spur of the moment creation. Each dish was infused with love and care that only a grandfather's touch could impart. Above all else, it was your unwavering love for family that defined you, a love that knew no bounds, transcending time and space, and weaving us together in a tapestry of cherished memories and treasured, I'm sorry, cherished moments and treasured memories. Michael Bruno Maureen, our grandpa, a fisherman, a storyteller, a chef, and above all, a beacon of love and light in our lives. May your spirit continue to guide us, your memory continue to inspire us, and your love continue to sustain us until we meet again in the endless expanse of the great beyond. Signed, all 24 of your grandchildren. Thank you. Indeed, not many can boast that their grandfather has a boat. And so I'm sure it, it is a skill to be a, a fisherman and when I think about the hard work that he would have put in, in doing that job and the care he took in doing that, we should all be happy about that. So we move on to the next item on our tribute list. And I would like to invite Chanel Rennie. Pleasant good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shannon Rennies, representing my husband, Chief Fisheries Officer, Justin Rennie. Protocol already established. Good afternoon, everyone. Tribute to the family of Michael Bruno Maureen, known as to the fishing community as Lloyd Maureen. From Justin Rennie, Chief Fisheries Officer, Fishery Division, Ministry of Agriculture, Lands, Forestry, and Marine Resources. I first met Lloyd as he was known to the fishing community on the Carnage in 1981, when I first joined the fisheries management unit, and that time at the ministry operated government-owned fish market on the Carnage. Most of the fishermen who operated on the Carnage came from parishes of St. David. In those days, the fisherman who supplied the fish to the fish market was, was renowned for producing what we know as choice fish, such as kingfish, barracuda, snapper, dolphin, and grouper. My introduction to the fisheries management was not the easiest of time because fishermen felt that in order to work in the fisheries sector, you must be able to understand the rugged nature of the fishing industry. <coughs> Excuse. Because in those days, all of the boats was open to the element of the weather and the use of safety equipment was non-existent. Hence, the uncertainty of returning to shore from, fishery, um, from, fish, from a fishing expedition was very real. Therefore, you had to be incredibly careful how you approach a fisherman, especially when he returned from his fishing trip because you will be faced with some choice words, real words. However, this gentleman, Lloyd, stood out among the fishers on the carnage, and I can say confidently, the entire fishing community of Grenada, I found Lloyd to be very pleasant and courteous, soft-spoken, and always carried himself with humility. I 
also observed that he was very much respected among his peers officials on the carnage. Lloyd always seems to have a prominent smile on his face. And he always said to me, Mr. Rennie, I'm not like these other guys you know. That was the nature of Lloyd. I knew that Lloyd was a person who took care and provided for his family because he always returned to his home at the end of the fishing week activity. As such, this must be a very difficult time for his family to lose such an a remarkable person, his wife, children, brothers, sisters, nieces, nephews, cousin, friend, and well-wishers. During the early 1980s, government established a fishing fund at the National Commercial Bank. This fund was to provide a soft loan facility for fishermen who own and operate their boats. For fishermen who never own a boat, the objective was to encourage and empower bona fide fishermen to become entrepreneurs of the fishing business in order to become more productive and develop themselves by extension, the fishing industry. Despite the good intention of the facility, many fishermen received loans from this fund never returned to the honor of commitment, which led to the closure of this facility 25 years later. Less than 5% of the fishers made some payment and less than 1% made off their loans in full, and Lloyd was part of the 1%. When I look at the monthly reports from the bank and saw the constantly of the payments by Lloyd, I would contact him and say, Lloyd, you know that you are doing exceptionally good with your repayments, and I want to compliment you on your effort. He always responded by saying, Mr. Rennie, I don't want to owe nobody. And that was the caliber of Lloyd. Honest, businesslike, disciplined, dedicated, and cooperative, exceptionally with the fisheries division. When the fish market on the carnage closes those over a over two decades ago, some fishers, including Lloyd, continued to ply their trade there. However, their operation eventually ceased due to the lack of proper facility to market their catches. Since then, most of the fishermen on the carnage would have migrated to other fishing areas with, with market facility and others shifted their operation to be convenient to them. From then, I lost contact with Mr. Lloyd and thought and it, and thought I inquired about him. I was never able to get in contact with him until his passing. On behalf of my family, the Fisheries Division, by extension the Ministry, I extend sincere condolences to the family and friend of Lloyd. Though he is gone, he will always be remembered by the family. He was a family man, a stalwart in the fishing industry. May his soul rest in eternal peace. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm sure all of us could agree, besides being an excellent fisherman, Mr. Lloyd was always a family man. And so I would like to invite one of his daughter, Karine, to do a tribute. And this would be followed by Kester's tribute. Good afternoon, everyone. What can I say about that man who, although he was a fisherman, taught me to stew chicken? He was a chef, too, as Alana alluded to. My father and I did not always agree, but I grew up to appreciate our differences and the way he looked at things. My father felt that it was his responsibility to provide for the family. So when I took up responsibilities in the home, he did not really appreciate it. I had to sometimes coax him into acceptance and tell him that I have grown up and that I am now in a position to provide assistance and make the load lighter for him in some instances. Our father-daughter relationship grew stronger over the years, especially when mom fell ill 
and was no longer able to communicate as she used to. That was there to always give a comforting word. He was there for me in my personal heartbreak situations. He would say, don't worry yourself. It's their loss. The right person will come your way one day. His wise words kept me safe. When my husband came along in short order and told dad of his interest in getting married to me, my dad agreed without even me telling without even telling me anything. Upon hearing the news, I was like, so daddy, you just said yes? <laughs> Did you ask him if he had money? <laughs> Do you know if he's able to take care of me? So you just want to get rid of me just so? <laughs> he just laughed and said, he is a good young man. He is hardworking and he loves you. He will take care of you. And he was right. I asked dad to walk me down the aisle. He said, why me? I said, because you're my father and you're the only man for the job. I wanted to buy him a suit, but he had some cloth that he already purchased that he had not touched yet. He said, don't bother, I'll take the cloth I have there to the, ta to the tailor to make me a suit. I said, you sure? He said, yeah man, maybe we'll make my suit. It was the first time I saw my dad in a suit uh, other than a picture of his wedding day with my mom. He looked dapper. I was so proud and he was too. When I got married and had to leave home to start my new life, it was about the same time he retired from fishing so that he could stay home and take care of mom who was ailing. My new home was just a stone's throw away from this church and daddy would visit very often. When we moved further away, daddy always looked forward to our visits and would always make sure we left with something in hand whether it was rock fig or coconuts from the land. When I had my first child, daddy was like, thank God, I got to see my last grandchild. But he lived to see two more. Daddy was a simple man and always said he was ready to accept death when it comes. Although my sister would jokingly say, daddy, if you see death now, you're running. I would often call daddy to find out how they're doing and, would give, and he would give me the scoop on our mother's health and the village news. Daddy's health started deteriorating and had to visit the doctor more regularly. The pains he experienced hurt me to the core, especially when I could not have done anything to soothe his pains. The pains he experienced hurt me to the core, especially when I could not have done anything to soothe his pains. But I prayed, and seemingly the pains are subsided. Dad knew he was going, and would say, girl, my body ain't feeling well, based on how I'm feeling. I ain't have a long hair. These moments were numbing for me, and I didn't really know what, how to respond. But one thing I know is that he wanted us to take good care of our mother. He would say, don't worry about me. I just want you all to take care of your mother. At the hospital, I visited daily, spending time to make sure he was comfortable. I continue to pray for a miracle, as I've been praying over the last few days, that you just walk back through the doors and tell me that I was only dreaming. But 
I also read it myself to be contented with God's will. For I know that you will always be with us as long as we believe. Heaven is your home, Daddy. In this I am confident. Thank you for all you've done. Me, I'm jealous of the angels around the throne tonight. You are a good father, and that's who you are. That's who you'll always be in our hearts. I don't know how to start. I'm here to do a song for my dad. My name is Kester Moraine. And I'm here to do a song called God is Standing By. It might be a little short, but I'm here to, to do something for my dad because I know he loves music. When you're in trouble, don't cry, oh no. Just remember that God is standing by. When you have heartaches, don't cry, oh no, oh no. Just remember that God is standing by sometimes when you but God is standing by thank you Lord so there's no need to cry no need to cry God is standing by. Thank you, Lord. So don't you worry and don't cry. When you're in trouble, don't cry. Oh, no. Just remember that God is standing by. God is standing by. Thank you, Lord. So don't you worry and don't cry. God is standing by. Thank you, Lord. So don't you worry and don't cry. Thank you very much. I'm sure all the angels are indeed clapping and singing at this moment. And I'm sure if Brother Lloyd could have said anything to his children, he would say, don't cry. Thank you for such wonderful rendition. At this time, we would now invite Mr. Adrian Francis. Is Mr. Adrian Francis here? Okay, so he's not. So in the meantime, we are going to have a little rendition in pan.
Amen. 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 Thank you very much, Mr. Seals, for this rendition of Amazing Grace. And that is always an opportunity for us to make changes. It's always an opportunity to engage in deep reflection. It is one of the things in life that is certain. Among all the things in life that may happen, if it is one thing that we are certain about, is death. For one day, it would be knocking at our door. Are we ready if it is knocking today? So these are just some little things that we really need to think about. Death is always an opportunity for us to make change, and that is for the living. The family would, the children actually, would like to do a special rendition paying tribute to their dad. And so I now invite the children of Brother Lloyd to do a special song in tribute.
I hear a sound of a mighty rushing winds, and it's closer now than it ever been. I can almost hear the trumpet as Gabriel sang the chorus at the midnight cry. We'll be going home when Jesus steps out.
My name is Latoya Maureen, and I'm here to do the eulogy of my dad, Michael Bruno Maureen, also known as Lloyd. Michael Bruno Maureen, also known as Lloyd Maureen, was the fourth child of the deceased Norbert and Anastasia Maureen the husband of Theresa Moraine, the father of 10 children and one adopted daughter. He was a very introverted and reserved individual, often preferring to stay at the background and not draw attention to himself in public. But to his family and friends, he was the life of the party. Good music brought life to him. Always singing, always whistling, always dancing, cracking a joke here and there, always telling his children the tales from long ago. Our fondest memory of him was music and dancing competition on weekends. Ladies and gentlemen, as we gather here today, we find ourself, ourselves in the midst of an ocean of emotions. It is not easy to say goodbye, especially to a man like our father. He was our guiding star our greatest mentor, and our dearest friend. His passing leaves a profound void, yet his spirit continues to surround and guide us. Our father was a man of humble beginnings, but he was rich in ways that cannot be measured by material possessions. He was rich in wisdom, in kindness, in love. He was the kind of man who knew the value of hard work, the importance of honesty, the strength of humility. His life was not an easy journey, but it was a journey he embarked on with courage and dignity. Daddy was a fisherman by profession, and he brought that same preci precision, dedication, and passion to every aspect of his life. But it was his role as a father that truly showcased the depth of his character. He was not just dad. He was a superhero without a cape a guiding light without a lantern, a teacher without a classroom. He spent most of his time on the Karanaj, but when he came home to his family on weekends, he definitely had to walk with candies and chocolates for his children. And that we used to look forward for. Daddy used to cook the best fish broth and when he did, tell yourself we're getting more fish in our plates than when our mommy cooked. He had a love for gardening. So we never had to buy provision, especially sweet potatoes, corn and peas, blogger, and bananas of all kinds. He had a love for his sisters and brothers their children and their grandchildren. So every evening he would take a walk down the road by teacher Homie's shop, that's his sister, to spend time with them and to play dominoes with the guys. Daddy, as we were blessed to call him, had a heart as vast as the universe. 
He loved unconditionally, gave generously, and forgave easily. He had a way of turning mundane moments into cherished memories. Daddy left his job as a fisherman just to come home to take care of his sick wife. And he did that with excellence. What a great privilege it was to have a father like my father. He taught us the importance of resilience, the power of kindness, and the value of integrity. He taught us to be brave in the face of adversity, to be compassionate in the face of cruelty, to be humble in the face of accolades. He used to say, Toya, self-praise is no praise. Let somebody stand up and tell you you're nice or you're doing a great job, but do not allow it to get to your head that you think you're better than people. He taught us not just how to live, but how to live well with purpose, passion, and with love. I stand here today and I'm reminded of his words, God is love. And that was a very sad name he gave to his boat. Dad lived his life embracing every moment, cherishing every breath. His legacy is not just in the years he lived, but in the lives he touched and the hearts he warmed, the souls he inspired. Today, as we bid farewell to our father, we are not just saying goodbye. We are saying thank you. Thank you, Dad, for your unwavering love, your endless patience, your invaluable lessons. Thank you for your laughter, your wisdom, and your guidance. Thank you for being my dad. Daddy, your physical presence may be absent, but your spirit lives on. Your love continues to surround us. Your wisdom continues to guide us. And your laughter continues to echo in our hearts. Rest in peace, dear dad. We will, you will always be loved, always be missed, and forever be remembered. Thank you. And as the children were singing, I was asking myself, can one man have so many children who are good at singing? <laughs> Mr. Lloyd had it, okay? So we want to thank those who participate in the tribute. I know some persons were not here who wanted to offer condolences or they wanted to make any remark. If these persons are here, I'll just give you two minutes so that you can do so. To God be the glory, great things he has done. My heart is warmed just being here to identify with the family, Pastor Newton, pastor of Sister Lissa and her family. And what a wonderful family indeed. We'd like to identify with you on the occasion of the passing of your dad is transitioning to a better place. And I am here on behalf of my wife, family, and the church family, 
at Ebenezer Pentecostal to extend our sincerest condolences to you. But I'm here to say this. And you know, I sat in my seat there and I was wondering, would I get the opportunity? Madam, thank you so much. And here's what I want to say. The morning of the 21st, when Brother Lloyd passed, Sister Lisa called me from work and she's given me an update on that. Immediately, I felt a compulsion to go see him. I asked Sister Lisa, are you at work? And what time would you be coming off duty? I said, I'm coming to meet you. We're going to see that. We got there about 5 p.m., thereabout. I prayed with him, we prayed with him. And it's like our presence there, a beam of light really flooded his life. You could see he was responding in his own way. I'm so glad that I had the opportunity to go see him and pray for him, albeit in his final moments. Dearly beloved, I don't know how I would have felt if Brother Lloyd passed and I didn't get an opportunity to pray with him. Between 5 p.m. that day, about 9 p.m., he passed. I'm so glad. And I want to assure you, dear family, that as we heard today, he, he lived a good life. He lived legacy. I'd like you to live in the memory or memories of your dad, your grandfather, and whatever he has been and whoever he has been to you. And I do know that the Lord is going to give you the grace, the strength, and all that you need, the days ahead, the weeks ahead, the months ahead, the years ahead. God bless you. And we thank everyone for sharing these moments with the family. God bless you. Thank you very much, Pastor Newton. And God works in mysterious ways. And you did actually what I had to do, which was to sort of tie things and put things to a closure. So I want to thank you for doing that. Um, we are about to begin the service. And so we invite the family and others to join the last viewing of the remains of Brother Lloyd. This would be followed by the reception of the body by Father Raymond. Father Raymond would be our celebrant for this evening's service. So please kindly go to the back to do the last viewing. And as I mentioned, this would be followed by the reception of the body. Remember, we are in God's house. It's a sacred place. So we kindly ask you to observe the rites as we go through the service. And let us kindly put all our cell phones in silent mode. Thank you.
mercy. Christ of mercy. You plead for us at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Lord, Lord have, mercy. have mercy. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, whose nature is always to forgive and to show mercy, we humbly implore you for your servant, Bruno Moraine, whom you have called to journey to you. And since he hoped and believed in you, grant that he may be led to our true homeland to delight in everlasting joys. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let us now be seated for the liturgy of the world. This reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 to 58. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doeth corruption inherit corruption. Behold, I shew you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought, brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death! Where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The word of the Lord. The Lord's my shepherd, I'm not one. He makes me down to life. In pastures Hey, 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 hey,
under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get, a time to lose. A time to keep, a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. What profit had that he worked in the wherein he labored? I have seen the travail which God had to the sons of men to be exercised in it. The word of the Lord. Glory and praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Glory and praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory be to you, Lord. Mary, the sister of Lazarus, went to Jesus. And as soon as she saw him, she threw herself at his feet, saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. At the sight of our tears and those of the Jews who followed her, Jesus said in great distress, with a sigh that came straight from the heart, Where have you put him? They said, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. And the Jews said, See how much he loved him. But there were some who remarked, He opened the eyes of the blind man, could he not have prevented this man's death? Still, sign, Jesus reached the tomb. It was a cave with a stone to close the opening. Jesus said, take the stone away. Martha said to him, Lord, by now he will smell, and this is the fourth day. Jesus replied, have I not told you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you for hearing my prayer. I knew indeed that you always hear me, but I speak for the sake of all these who stand round me, so that they may believe it, that it was you who sent me. When he had said this, he cried in a loud voice, Lazarus, here, come out. The dead man came out, his feet and hands bound with bands of stuff and a cloth round his face. Jesus said to them, Unbind him, let him go free. Many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what he did believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. 
I do not remember attending any funeral here in Grenada that had this kind of attendance. So I'm moved to think that our dear brother and friend, Bruno Moraine, must have really been loved while he lived. That explains why we have so many people gather to mourn his demise. And that confirms that even as man, even as human beings, we can tell when somebody is doing something right. We can also tell when we are on the right path, and we can tell when we are not. At death, when we have the opportunity to attend people's funerals, I think it's more important that we think about our own funerals, where we may not be able to make any contribution. Is there a chance that when I one day lie in a casket like Bruno, I would have this crowd mourning my demise? That should be a question I would like to ask myself. So if there's something wrong that I think I know of now that is capable of deterring people from attending my funeral, maybe going to bars, drinking and rejoicing my death instead, that this is a time to solve that problem. That's how I like to reflect around the reality of death. And yes, we cannot avoid it. And that is a Catholic perspective to it. Death is a necessary end that must come when it must come. And that's why in the second reading taken from the book of Ecclesiastes, you heard Coelet, the eloquent preacher, reminding us that to everything in life, there is a time and season. And whatever has a beginning certainly has an end. So we cannot live our lives as though we are here to stay. We cannot live our lives as though we have become eternal rock of ages here on earth. Only one person has that title, God. So we must live our lives with a sense of accountability. We must live our lives with a consciousness that one day it will end. And that inevitable end, when it comes upon us, where would it take us? Would it take us to God's presence? Or would it take us away from God's presence? As Christians, we have one common destiny, and that destiny is heaven which is exactly what we call God's presence. And it is our hope that when we die, our death takes us into God's presence. And that defines the eternal life that Jesus promised, the eternal life that we hear of, especially in the gospel that we just took. Unfortunately, many of us as Christians, we confuse eternal life, in other words, what Jesus calls resurrection, we confuse that with longevity. Eternal life is not the same with longevity. Longevity is my capacity to live long here on earth. The Bible says a span is 70 years or 80 for those who are strong. But I see that here, here in Grenada you are exceptionally blessed with longevity because I've seen people in their 90s still driving. We've seen people 100 coming to church. So we are really blessed here. Not many of us from outside Grenada enjoy that gift. But even as we have that gift here in Grenada, we must know that that is exactly not what Jesus promised in the gift of eternal life. Eternal life is a lot more resplendent. It's a lot more sublime. It's a lot more beneficial. That's why we must not get carried away with the length of days that God blessed us with in the gift of longevity that he may have granted and forget that ultimately we are called not for a life that will last long because that's what longevity is but a life that will last forever. There's a significant difference. To last long does not mean you're lasting forever. So let us not mistake lasting long and begin to think that that is what we desire, that's what we crave. No, that's not what we should crave. What we should crave is better than lasting long. What we should crave is lasting forever. And that one is what theology and holy doctrine defines as eternal life. In the gospel, Jesus granted longevity to Lazarus. He extended his days. 
He made him to live longer. But do you think Lazarus did he die eventually? Of course he died. Because unless we die, unless we give up this life that we have now, we really cannot have access to that one that lasts forever, the one that subsists forever. So our true Christian vocation is eternal life. And that's why we must not get too used to the beauty of the world as we have it. We must not get too used to the comfort of this life. We must not get carried away because of the bliss that we enjoy, because there's so much beauty to enjoy here in Grenada, especially. You have beautiful beaches. You enjoy yearly beautiful carnivals. And the days like these where we, years like this where we celebrated the 50th anniversary, it was like celebrations without end. Sometimes we get to enjoy life so much and we forget that we are not here to stay. And that's why as Christians we must remember that we are on a pilgrimage. There's no way we will see a train station or a bus station or an airport so beautiful because some of them in England and in the US, you see that it can be so beautiful. And then you wonder, probably I shouldn't continue to my destination. Maybe I should remain here. Because sometimes these airports or train stations and bus stations are even more beautiful than our homes. So why would I want to go home when I have somewhere more comfortable here? Does anybody ever think like that? Is there a chance that you would think that an airport has become so beautiful you don't want to continue to your destination? It does not happen. Because home is home. So let us not forget that this earth is our airport, if you like it like that. It's our train station, it's our bus station. We are on a journey. By all means, we must continue. We must keep moving. Let us not get carried away and we now decide to remain here. A time will come when the trumpet will sound, where the bell will ring, and like Bruno, we'll be ready to go. And that's why we must begin to reassess our understanding of death. In the first reading, St. Paul reminded us very well that death is that change of state that all of us crave. If we must desire to progress from a life that lasts long into a life that lasts forever, then there has to be a transition point, and that is called death. Death is that vehicle that moves us from mortality to immortality. Death is that vehicle tra that transports us from earth into heaven. It is that vehicle that moves, from, moves us from a land, from a, li a life that has capacity to be sick, capacity to be weak, capacity to hunger, capacity to labor, ca capacity to be sorrowful, capacity to shed tears. It is that vehicle that moves us from that life to a life that knows no night, that knows no day, that knows no pain, that knows no sorrow, that does not need to work, that does not need to labor, because it is an eternal day in the Lord's eternal presence. All that we need is provided by the Lord. That is what we must desire. That is what we must yearn for. So that's why we must begin to see death differently. For us Christians, we should be happy when that day comes. Because that reminds us of our eternal destiny, which is to be in God and to be with God forever and ever. So let us not mourn like pagans. Because I've seen many people who deserted God because they prayed for somebody to be healed from their sickness and the person never recovered. They prayed for somebody not to die, but the person eventually died. In fact, I know of a certain man who was a pastor who claimed that he left the church because he had just one person he loved in this life, his mother. He begged God when she was sick, Lord, I've served you. I've ministered in your name. Please, there's just this one thing I ask. My mother, spare her. Don't let her die. But unfortunately for him, God did not, according to him, hear his prayers. And the woman died. And he was so devastated. He despaired so terribly. He could not continue in the ministry to which the Lord called him. He left the church and became an atheist. He became a champion of that position that God does not exist. Why? Because according to him, God did not hear his prayers. If I had a chance, because I, I listened to this conversation over the, the, the television, even though I know the man, but we're not particularly close, but I listened to this conversation over the television. If I had a chance to have a private conversation with him, I would have loved to ask him, all the years you ministered as a pastor, what did you believe life to be? 
Do you exactly think that we are here to stay? If God spared your mother, does that mean that she would not eventually die? Is there a way that God will hear you today and the woman does not die, and tomorrow you still tell God, don't let her die, and therefore she continues to live and live and live on the face of the earth and never die? Or is there a time that you actually be willing and be happy to go and meet God? Okay, God, all right, okay, I think I'm waiting and ready now. Let my mother come and be with you. Let my mother die now. Is there a time that we can willingly tell God, okay, I'm ready to die now? There's no, never going to be that time. So if I had a chance, I would have asked him, if you loved your mother, wouldn't you want the best to come to her? What is better than heaven? And if death is that moment where we have to be called to heaven, wouldn't that be the best gift that God could ever grant to you? So rather, rather than thinking that God did not hear his prayer, God actually heard his prayer by asking his mother to come be with him forever and ever. But unfortunately, our understanding of Christian faith has become very materialistic. Our understanding of Christian faith has become very physical, such that we only understand blessing from the things that are tangible, from the things that we can see, from the things that we can feel, from the things that we can touch. Protection is not only understood from the perspective of some brigand not breaking into my house, or some miscreant not harassing me along the way. We have forgotten that the ultimate protection that we need is protection from the gates of hell. We define grace only from material prosperity, so that we begin to say we are prosperous, that God blesses us with his grace only when we live in the most luxurious houses, we eat the best and most exquisite cuisines, we drive the best of cars. That's what defines grace for us now. That's what defines prosperity for us now. We must begin to move from this materialistic understanding of life and begin to aspire more for a spiritual growth, a more sublime understanding of eternal life, such that we can grow in this understanding and therefore get more and more distasteful with this world. So we don't get too satisfied with the world and what it has to offer, and we forget that we should yearn for something better. Jesus came that we may have life and have it to the full. So when people die, especially our loved ones, we should see it from the perspective of a call to glory. Bruno is now called to glory. He is now called to eternal life. He's now called to experience life without pain. He's now called to experience life without sorrow. He's now called to a life that does not require his hustle or his bustle. He's now called to that life where he does not need to go to bed, where he will be always awake, where he will not need to be anxious about his health, where he will not need to dread death. He has now conquered death forever. Every day we live with the fear of death. Maybe before I drive back to St. George's now, you gather next time for my own funeral. Because I live in that contingency. It's either I die today or I don't die today. That is our faith, all of us, until that day actually comes when we die today. But he has now conquered that anxiety. He has moved beyond that crisis. He's now eternally in God's presence. And this is our desire. It's our utmost vocation. So we thank God for his life. And we pray that if there's any inadequacy that he may have acquired that may delay his transition, that the Lord will grant him eternal forgiveness. That the Lord will grant him repose and admit him into his eternal presence. While we are at it, while we are praying for his eternal repose, this calls us to evaluate our own Christian progress and see to it that we are doing the things that the Lord wants us to do. So that if there's anything that can be capable of constituting an obstacle in our way as we journey towards God, then we have a chance to remove it. We can easily measure, we can actually find that out if we are doing well or not. We started by asking us to think and make a hypothesis. If I am the one in this casket now, would I be able to pull this crowd? If I'm not good enough to pull this crowd, it's a good way to tell me, look, better sit up. There's something you're doing and it's not right. 
If man is not at peace with you, there's a good chance that God is not at peace with you. So this is the time. That's why Jesus always insists on reconciliation. Reconciliation with men and then reconciliation with God. That's why he said, if you have something to offer me, and you remember there is somebody somewhere that you're not at peace with, leave that thing at the foot of the altar, go back and settle with that person, and then come make your offering. It's that important to God. So if there's something standing on my way now that might prevent my offering from being acceptable to God, this is the time to resolve that. Because I don't know that day. Bruno didn't know that day. He lived every day with the hope that he would get it tomorrow. We are always living with the hope that we will get it tomorrow. But the day will come when we will not get it tomorrow. We celebrate our birthday, but people will mark our anniversary when we die. Because we will never know in anticipation, in advance, that we will die on so, so and so day. That's why every day must be a preparation for that, for that day. Let us not wish it away as though it will never come. That there's something we will do to prevent us from dying. It's an illusion. It's utopic. That does not exist. That there's something we can do that will prevent us from dying. Since there's nothing we can do that can prevent us from dying, then every day should be a preparation for death. So that death will take us from earth into heaven. And then we can define death truly as a call to glory. May the Lord grant eternal repose to Bruno and truly allow him to experience his eternal glory where he lives and reigns forever and ever. For the prayers of the faithful. Dear friends, we are gathered to pray for the eternal repose of our dear brother and friend, Bruno Moraine. Let us now pray that Lord we accept our offering on his behalf and grant him eternal repose in his kingdom. For this we pray, Lord hear our prayers. Your response will be, Lord hear our prayers. Lord hear our prayers. Let us pray for families and friends, those who loved Bruno while he lived, those who are now left to mourn him in his demise, that the Lord will grant them consolation and comfort, that they may be assured with the blessed assurances of hope that when we die, we are with the Lord and most certainly in a better place. For this we pray. Lord, hear our prayers. Let us pray for those who are sick, those who are pressed down with life's pains, the Lord will grant them his support and consolation in their pains and in their trials. For this we pray. Lord, Lord hear our prayers. prayers. Let us pray for the dying. The Lord will console them as they journey to the great beyond. For this we pray. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayers. prayers. Let us pray for all grieving families, even the ones who are not with us, but share in this sentiment of grief with us. The Lord will console them and grant them support in their mourning. For this we pray. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayers. Let us pray for all the souls in purgatory. That the Lord who is merciful, the Lord who wishes to grant eternal life to all, we forgive them whatever sins they may have committed that deters them from experiencing eternal life with him and grant, him, grant them all eternal joy and peace in his kingdom. For this we pray. Lord, in the silence of our hearts, let us now add our individual intentions. We unite our prayers with Mary, mother of Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life. Hail Mary. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. 
Lord our God. You gave us your Son to assure us of eternal life. And he promised us that whoever believes in him, even though they die, they would live forever. We commend to your eternal mercy our dear brother and your son, Bruno Moraine, that now, even though he lies in death, you grant him eternal resurrection and eternal life in your presence, where you live and reign forever and ever. Collection him. Give up, give it all you've got. He loves to hear you laughing when you're in an awkward spot. When the odds are up against you, it's time to stop and sing. Praise God, to praise Him is a joyous thing. Peter always made a fuss. Peter was impetuous in you. But Offer him because he lives. Oh, 
would send his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love. He and forgive. to you these sacrificial offerings, O Lord, for the salvation of your servant, Bruno. We beseech your mercy that he who did not doubt your son to be a loving savior may find in him a merciful judge who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. In Him the hope of blessed resurrection has gone, that those saddened by the certainty of dying might be consoled by the promise of immortality to come. Indeed, for your faithful Lord, life is changed, not ended. And when this earthly dwelling turns to dust, an eternal dwelling is made ready for them in heaven. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim.
fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts we pray by sending down your spirit upon them like we do for, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and gave him thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice. And once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of a new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Save us, Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection you have set us free. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation. Giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, and Clyde Martin, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember your servant, Bruno Moraine, whom you have called from this world to yourself. Grant that he who was united with your son in a death like his may also be one with him in his resurrection. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with the Blessed Joseph, a chaste spouse, with the Blessed Apostles, with St. Bruno, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, Informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our oh, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil, and graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And, and with your spirit. spirit. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. We will sing the fugitive from God. You've been running, running for a 
Come in at him, we remember. We remember. Still we celebrate for you are with us here. 
Let perpetual light shine upon them with your saints forever, for you are merciful. Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon him with your saints forever, for you are merciful. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, whose son left us in the sacrament of his body, food for the journey. Mercifully grant that strengthened by it, our brother Bruno Moraine may come to eternal table of Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated.
As we come to the final commendation, I'd like to join my voice with that of Father Raymond to thank all of you for your presence here, for your prayers, and for your support to the family of Mr. Michael Bruno Moraine. I'd like to, in a special way, to pray for his dear wife, Theresa, for the will of God to be done and for the health that God himself wants as we keep praying for the entire family, especially for his dear children, especially Beverly, uh, Kevin, Lisa, Kesta, Kent, and Michelle, who I think is not able to make it, Karim, Latoya, Roland, and Dwayne. May God himself be your strength and be with you throughout this difficult time. Shall we stand for the final commendation? Before we go our separate ways, let us take leave of our brother. May our farewell express our affection for him. May it ease our sadness and strengthen our hope that one day we shall joyfully greet him again when the love of Christ, which conquers all things, destroys even death itself. Our response will be, receive his soul and present him to God the Most High. Receive his soul and present him to God the Most High. Saint of God, come to his aid. Hasten to meet him, angels of the Lord. Receive his soul and present him to God the Most May Christ who call you take you to himself. May angels lead you to the bosom of Father Abraham. Receive his soul and present him to God the Most High. Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord, and let the future light shine upon him. Receive his soul and present him to God the Most High. Into your hands, Father of mercies, we commend our brother, Michael, in the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ, he will rise with him on the last day. We give you thanks for the blessings which you have bestowed upon him in this life. They are signs to us of your goodness and of our fellowship with all the saints in Christ. Merciful Lord, Turn towards us and listen to our prayers. Open the gates of paradise to your servants, Michael, and help us who remain to comfort one another with assurances of faith until we all meet in Christ and now with you and with our brother forever and ever. Amen. 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 May the angels lead you into paradise. May the martyrs come to welcome you home and take you to the holy city, the new and eternal Jerusalem. Amen. We now in peace take our brother to his final place of rest. Thank you everyone for coming. Walk with me, oh my Darkest night and brightest day Be at my side, O oh Lord Hold my hands and guide me on my way Sometimes the road seems long, my energy is spent Then, Lord, I think of you and I am given strength Walk with me, O oh my Lord Night and bright and 